When I first became interested in the subjects of this Third Testament, St. Augustine, Pascal, Blake, Kierkegaard, Tolstoy and Bonhoeffer, I saw them separately as six characters in search of God. Thinking about them afterwards, it became clear to me that though they were all quintessentially men of their time, they had in common a special role to relate their time to eternity. This has to be done every so often. Otherwise, we forget that when the law of self-sufficiency proves too strong or despair too overwhelming, men need to be called back to God to rediscover humility and with it, hope. In the case of the Old Testament Jews, it was the prophets who thus called them back to God. Then came the New Testament when through the Incarnation, God became his own prophet. Nor was even that the end of testaments and prophets. Between the fantasy of the ego and the truth of love, between the darkness of the will and the light of the imagination, there will always be a bridge and a prophetic voice calling us to cross it. So august, when Rome fell, and like a later Noah, he was constrained to construct an ark, in his case called orthodoxy, wherein his church could survive through the dark days that lay ahead. Thanks largely to him, the light of the New Testament didn't go out with Rome's, remaining amidst the debris of a fallen empire to light the way to another civilization, Christendom, whose legatees we are. It was as though he'd been specially groomed for the task, tempered in the fires of his own sensuality, toughened by his arduous exploration of the age's many heresies, for instance, Manichaeism, a master of words, which, written or spoken, he offered in God's service, first asking that God would give him the wherewithal to offer. No one knows for certain what Augustine looked like, but we have the image of his time in contemporary mosaics, and the North African countryside he belonged to remains. In Augustine's eyes, Rome stood at the very pinnacle of history. He saw it as the secular state carried to the highest degree of perfection and providing the only tolerable framework of life for mankind. Its disappearance from our human scene, if so unthinkable a catastrophe were ever to occur, would leave behind not other alternative civilizations, but a vacuum, a darkness. Augustine's own North Africa partook of this glory. Carthage was a little Rome. The abundant harvests, the flourishing cities and ports, the entertainments and spectacles, all signified participation in the great Roman Empire, which to Augustine was the whole world. 
people and the prosperity have vanished, now only to be imagined from the ruins of their former magnificence. Augustine was born in the year 354, some 40 years after Christianity had become the acknowledged religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine. His birthplace was here in this hilly district of North Africa, then known as Numidia. In one of the many small towns, like this one, Duga, which was scattered about what was then a rich and luxuriant countryside, his father, Patricius, belonged to the middle classes and was reasonably well off, except that he was a victim of the very excessive taxation which characterized those troubled years. He was, I suppose you could say, a worldly man who remained a pagan till right at the end of his life when he was belatedly baptized a Christian. Augustine's mother, Monica, on the other hand, was a Christian of tremendous piety, without any question. Her devotions and meditations were conducive to his not fulfilling his father's purpose and becoming a successful lawyer or civil servant, but, as she hoped, dedicating his life to the service of Christ and the church. She made him a saint, and his sanctity resulted in due course in her being canonized. His studies went easily. He excelled and quite soon became a teacher of rhetoric, a rather empty and pretentious discipline, which in those days was very highly regarded, rather as sociologists is are today. He, looking back on it, called it contemptuously, being a vendor of words. Alas, my own trade. By the end of the fourth century, the decadence which had afflicted Rome had spread to the North African provinces, especially, of course, to the great port and metropolis of Carthage, at whose university Augustine studied and later taught. Thence, he transferred to Rome, because he said he found the Carthage students too turbulent, a very contemporary touch. In Rome, he easily consorted with some of the most famous figures of the time and was appointed to the chair of rhetoric in Milan, which brought him into contact with the imperial court and what was much more important from the point of view of his subsequent career with the famous and saintly Bishop Ambrose. So, at the age of 30, he'd reached the summit of a career with a dazzling prospect before him. But somehow, he remained totally unsatisfied. He called his university appointment his chair of lies, knowing in his heart that God had some other purpose for him, which, try as he might, he would never be able to escape. Games in the theatre were given over to wildly expensive spectacles of violence and eroticism, like the cinema and increasingly television today. To judge by the way that after his conversion, Augustine never lost an opportunity of thundering against such spectacles, it's reasonable to assume that he was by no means immune to their appeal. There's also the touching story in the confessions of his friend who, with a great effort, managed to break his addiction to the games then was tricked into going to them, and venturing to open just one of his eyes, was hooked again.
pagan temples still functioned, but few attended or heeded them. The Christian churches, now under state patronage, were not strong enough to counteract or even always to resist the prevailing atmosphere of luxury, violence and self-indulgence. Augustine himself, with his sensual disposition and inquiring mind, was little disposed to hold aloof. Though a certain fastidiousness in him, intellectually and physically, prevented him from succumbing wholly to a way of life which, if he had, would assuredly have destroyed him. Living now, I should say, find it easier to get inside Augustine's unregenerate skin than perhaps any of the intervening generations. The similarity between his circumstances and ours is striking, not to say alarming. There's the same moral vacuity, leading to the same insensate passion for new sensations and experiences. The same fatuous credulity, opening the way to every kind of charlatanry and quackery, from fortune-telling to psychoanalysis. The same sinister combination of great wealth and pointless ostentation with appalling poverty and unheeded affliction. Oh, greedy men, Augustine wrote, what will satisfy you if God himself will not? We know what it was like. We know, too, that to a temperament sensual and imaginative, like Augustine, sexual indulgence makes the greatest appeal, precisely because it offers a kind of fraudulent ecstasy, joys that expire when the neon lights go out. There's nothing so powerful, he said, when he was a bishop, in drawing the spirit of a man downwards as the caresses of a woman. He was speaking from experience, and I, for what it's worth, endorse his opinion. To a provincial like the young Augustine, the Mediterranean seen from this North Africa coast seemed like the gateway to the larger world of Rome. I dare say the young Emerson or the young Henry James or for that matter the young T.S. Eliot saw the Atlantic in the same sort of way. After all, Augustine was a very ambitious man and in his time, as in ours, Eminence at letters or as an academic could lead to positions of great power and responsibility. Also, I think, he wanted to escape from the watchful eye of his mother, Monica, and indulge freely 
in what Pascal called licking the earth, and Augustine, after his conversion, called scratching the itching sore of lust. So, one night, to avoid the pain and embarrassment of saying goodbye to his mother, taking with him his mistress and their son, Adeodatus, he slipped away across the sea. It was, on any showing, a very unkind thing to do. And afterwards, his contrition for it was very great. So it was the most natural thing in the world for Augustine to make his way to Rome and thence to the emperor's court at Milan to seek his fortune. Worldly success was his for the taking. This book, Augustine's Confessions, is really the first autobiography in the modern sense ever written. So we know more about him than about any other figure in antiquity. Of course, it's not just an account of what happened to him, of his life. It's also an account of the quest for truth in which he was engaged. And so the culminating point in it, from his point of view at any rate, is his conversion. He naturally thought, like St. Paul, that this conversion happened at a particular moment. But actually, it was the result of a long process, which began even before he was aware of it. Knowing his nature, Monica had hurried after her son to Milan to watch over him there and pray for his soul's redemption. Some of the friends he'd made among the amusing, the cultivated and the well-born turned out to be Christians, which came as something of a surprise to Augustine, who in North Africa had associated Christianity with the poor and the lowly. In Italy, a great Roman administrator like Ambrose might renounce his career to become a bishop, and rich heiresses dispose of all their property to the church. It was under Ambrose's influence that Augustine began to study the scriptures, noting particularly the spiritual meaning of Old Testament stories which had formerly made little impression on him. This played an important part in his final deliverance from Manichaeism and his ultimate conversion. Representations of Christ as an idealized young Roman no doubt came as a surprise to Augustine and impressed him. And how poignant must have seemed to him the figure of Christ before Pilate, the type of Roman governor which at one time Augustine perhaps aspired to be. The climax of Augustine's conversion occurred in a garden in Milan and its fulfillment in another garden in the country. I think he must have loved gardens. He seemed to see truth most clearly in them. There's one episode in the process leading up to his conversion that particularly takes my fancy. He writes, my misery was complete, and I remember how one day you made me realize how utterly wretched I was. I was preparing a speech in praise of the emperor, intending that it should include a great many lies, which would certainly be applauded by an audience who knew well enough how far from the truth they were. I was greatly preoccupied by this task, and my mind was feverishly busy with its harassing problems. As I walked along one of the streets of Milan, I noticed a poor beggar, who must, I suppose, have had his fill of food and drink, since he was laughing and joking. Contrasting their two conditions, 
He's so troubled. The beggar's so cheerful. He cried out in desperation. Will you never see setting your heart on shadows and following a lie? His anguish and contrition are all too actual to me after more than 40 years in the same sort of profession. Nonetheless, Augustine's mind continued to be occupied with thoughts of fame and success. And he was planning a rich marriage, having